My name is Jim Turk, and I'm the director of the Center for Free Expression. And I would like to welcome you to the sixth in the Center for Free Expression series, Taming Big Tech, Exploring the Alternatives. I want to begin today's session by acknowledging that the land on which I am speaking to you today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Uh, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. Our conversation today is titled, Use a Scalpel or a Club? It is being co-sponsored, and I want to thank our co-sponsors by the Edmonton Public Library, the Milton Public Library, the Thunder Bay Public Library, the Toronto Public Library, and the Vancouver Public Library. Our guest today, our featured guest, is a quite a remarkable Canadian, Conrad von Finkelstein. Uh, Conrad uh, has had a outstanding, almost 50 year public service career, many parts of which are directly relevant to the issues that we are exploring in our Taming Big Tech series. Uh, it, discussing how we deal with the challenges of big, big tech in a democratic society. Conrad was commissioner of competition, that is head of the Competition Bureau Canada, uh, where he dealt with major airline mergers, the attempted merger of Canada's four largest banks. And he also imposed the largest fine in Canadian criminal history for price collusion. He served as a judge of the Federal Court of Canada rendering almost 200 judgments on administrative law, intellectual property, and human rights. And he was chair of the Canadian Radio, Television, and Telecommunications Commission, the CRTC. He led the commission largely in, deregula in deregulating uh, much of the telecom sector and in adopting policies on net neutrality, diversity of voices in broadcasting, vertical integration of communication companies and group licensing of broadcasters. And as all of, or as many of you may know, uh, issues with regard to competition, uh, antitrust legislation, uh, involving the CRTC in dealing with issues as it was proposed in Bill C-10 by the present government before the election are all issues uh, that are quite pertinent to our discussions. Conrad will be in conversation with Andrew Clement. Andrew is Professor Emeritus of the at the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto, where he uh, coordinates the Information Policy and Research Program and co-founded the Identity, Privacy and Security Institute. He has a PhD in computer science and has a longstanding research and teaching interests in the social implications of uh, information communication technologies and participatory design. Welcome, Conrad, and welcome, Andrew. The format for today's discussion uh, will be a conversation between Andrew and Conrad for about uh, 45 to 55 minutes, after which we'll bring the audience into the conversation. If you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. So at any time uh, during their conversation, a question comes to mind that you would like to ask them, please uh, just click on that button and write down your question. You don't have to wait till we turn to the audience. Just do that during the course of, of their conversation. So uh, as the questions come up, they will be uh, entered. And Ange Holmes, the coordinator of the center, will then uh, read out the questions uh, to Conrad and Andrew when uh, we turn to the audience. That's all for me now. Uh, and over to the two of you. I'm looking forward to your conversation. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you, uh, Jim, and, uh, and, and welcome, Conrad, and, and welcome to all those um, out there in Zoom land. Um, this, I'm reaching you from my home on the West Coast in the unceded territory and ancestral homelands of the Salish-speaking peoples. I live near Victoria, which memorializes the imperial monarch in whose name this territory was stolen to establish what to this day is called, we called British Columbia. And we're able to have this conversation thanks to a remarkable digital network whose physical features belie its popular characterization as a placeless cloud. 
in North America at least, the fiber optic cables carrying the signals between us all still largely follow the railways that colonial agents pushed through the lands of numerous First Peoples. The digital switching centers are located mainly in big featureless buildings in the core of our largest cities, a short distance from where these railways met over a century ago. This high degree of physical centralization of critical network infrastructure has greatly facilitated our signal intelligence agencies, the NSA in the United States and CSE in, in Canada, to intercept all our internet communication and selectively monitor it in the name of national security. Hello. Uh, Conrad, it's, it's really an honor and a pleasure to be uh, talking uh, with you. As Jim has mentioned, you've had a very long and distinguished queer, career devoted to public service, so, so I really thank you for that. And you've contributed to resolving thorny issues in a remarkable range of industry sectors, as I mentioned banking and airlines among them. But over the last decade, you've become quite a prominent advocate for the internet as a relatively unfettered medium for communication. You've recently received um, a, the founder or a founder of Canada's Digital Economy Award, and um, you're currently vice president of the Internet Society of, of Canada. And uh, in the last year, you've written several um, important opinion pieces, um, particularly responding to uh, changes, uh, proposed changes in the broadcasting Act. Um, first of all, Bill C-10, as it was called. And, and in a Globe and Mail opinion piece you wrote last May, the purpose of the Broadcasting Act and the CRTC's myriad of content regulations has always been to regulate the behavior of license holders, or if you will, the gate holders of media access. The purpose of the internet was always to ensure the absence of gates and the liberation of the gate kept. Little wonder then that Bill C-10's ham-fisted stifling of that recently gained freedom has inspired such a thunderous public backlash from both marginalized and mainstream groups accustomed to their liberty. We'll be getting into Bill C-10 and media access gate gatekeeping in a moment, but I'd like to begin with the part about the purpose of the internet. Um, while clearly the Broadcasting Act has, has explicit purposes, I don't think there's any comparably focused purpose for the inter internet uh, as such. To my mind, the internet is far too flexible and open to competing interests seeking to shape it in diverse directions to ascribe any inherent purpose. A central issue of contention is whose interests will prevail in defining what the internet is and can be. But I think we would agree, both agree, that an enduring promise of the internet is that it is a radically more participatory, even liberatory communications medium than what conventional publishing, telephonic, and broadcasting media have become. And further, to a quite remarkable degree, we've seen that promise being fulfilled in practice. Um, but this ideal is facing a number of threats. So I'd like to begin um, by asking you what you see as the principal values that the internet um, promises for, for individuals, communities, and Canadian society more, more generally. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me here. I am delighted to exchange views with you. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I don't quite share your view of saying the purpose of the internet is, etc. I think the internet is a phenomena. It's an incredible new invention, which has a phenomenal disruptive uh, capacity and also an innovative capacity. And we have to live with it. We have to make sure we uh, use the positive sides because it will drive the digital economy of today and tomorrow, no question about it. It is a centerpiece. But it also, of course, has very negative features, which we know in online harm, fraud, and the dark net web, and all of this. So it's, the idea is that we have to develop a capacity to live with it and have a system that brings out and fosters the positive sides and suppresses or eliminates the negative sides. And that's really why Ever since I was commissioner, I uh, was chairman of the CRTC, I've said this is something completely new, it's something nobody anticipated. When we created our present communication structure, we basically divided the world 
into communications to carriers, common carrier principles. You carry the message, you don't interfere with it, and uh, you make sure that everybody can get reached and access and you don't discriminate. That was a basic principle. On the other side, we had co uh, content and broadcasting. We wanted a specific goal. We wanted a broadcasting system that reflects Canada, its values and its views, and it did not Hollywood. And so therefore we, we've used the, the fact that the capacity was very sparse and the spectrum limited to say, if you provide content, these are the rules that you have to play by. And the rules were all designed, every single one of them, to make sure that the system by and large reflects Canada. That was great. And we actually, you know, and, and we had a constitutional, uh, institutional setup for it too, the CRTC, on the one hand, the Minister of Industry for Communication, the Minister of Heritage for Broadcasting. It all made sense. Well, along comes the big disruptor, the internet. And suddenly, you know, we have convergence, we have, com uh, have, have conveyance and uh, content put together. We have huge companies emerging like, uh, like, like Facebook. Facebook is a, is a social media company. It's also a communications company, but it doesn't just carry the content, it curates it, it deals with it, et cetera. So this is a whole new world. And we really have to sit back, conceptualize, what do we do? How do we handle it? And as I said before, how do we get the, the positive aspects out of it and to maximize them and uh, attenuate the negative ones? And I always thought that the way to do it is call the Royal Commission. That's how we normally deal with these new things that come upon us. And we bring the best minds together we have a huge public discussion, submissions, etc. And you finally have a report which lays out something like blueprints. This is how we should, end. and the government then has adopted wholly or partially. We haven't done that. We have yeah. been less fully ignoring it, basically. We've been enjoying the benefits of it, like what we're doing right now. You and I, I'm in Florida, you are in Vancouver, and we're having this conversation as if we are sitting next to each other. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. we, have, we all love it. And, and thousands of other benefits. But in terms of it, we have not changed either of those key, let's see, um, uh, key Canadian statutes, the Radio Communications Act, the Communica Telecommunications Act, or the Broadcasting Act since the late 80s. We haven't changed the uh, institutional structure, and we haven't really de developed a new concept at all. Last year, for, for, for the first time, we made some efforts. We had this uh, uh, broadcasting and legislative uh, uh, re legislation review panel, but it also started with the same thing. We have these three statutes. How should we amend it? What should be done? Nobody says, like, hey, we're in a new world. We have a digital challenge upon it. How do we do a look at this, etc.? And as a result, we've got C10, which tries to amend the Broadcasting Act and actually tries to harness it, tries to bring it into the the whole internet into the structure of the of the yeah. uh, of of the broadcasting act, allegedly because we want to make sure that the big uh, streamers who are here, like Netflix, etc., pay their dues. But it does far more than that, and it's completely the wrong approach, as far as I'm concerned. As I say, you've got to get, develop a new concept, face, face the new reality that you have, and then the devolve the necessary statutes and institutional setup to deal with it. Yeah, well, I, I very much think we're on the same page about uh, you know all of that. And I remember talking with you uh, like 15 years ago when you were proposing a, a Royal Commission, when I think it was yeah. Tony Clement and no relation uh, was proposing a digital con economy consultation. So, I mean, this has been a, a longstanding frustration, I think for us both that, that the issues around the internet have not been de dealt with in, in any sort of comprehensive um, uh, and thoughtful full way. It's, it's, it's been hands-off regulation from the beginning, and there's some virtue in that, but we, I think we're seeing um, that inattention um, coming home to roost at this point. So just um, in reference specifically to the um, 
to the two of the bills, one the C10 uh, changes to the Broadcasting Act, and then more recently to uh, the proposals for the uh, dealing with um, online um, harm um, or, or harmful content on online, Bill C36, as it was, both of those died in the order paper, but are going to be, you know, revived according to the to the government soon. So, um, what would you like to see? in those um, when they come back. And you complained that they were using a club um, and, and suggested that a scalpel would be a more appropriate ap approach. Um, well, how would you wield a, a, a scalpel? Do you think you, there are things that you, could, you would do with the Broadcasting Act or um, uh, in the short term, because there's intense pressure on the government yeah. to deal with this, uh, doesn't look like there's going to be more comprehensive legislation anytime soon. So, so what okay. would you, what would you what do you think is the big problems and, and that we need to be looking out for uh, when it comes back to, to well, Parliament? There's, there's several problems with it. I mean, uh, first of all, what's the purpose? I, the uh, Minister Gibel said it was to bring in the streamers they have here. They're part of the Canadian broadcasting system, but they don't pay any contribute anything. They don't pay their fair share. Assuming that that is a purpose. Well, first of all, what should be the scope of the act? With the act, does says it basically defines broadcasting undertakings to include online undertakings. So they're trying to bring them. What type of underlying? Clearly, not everyone. Not everybody who have voice has voice or video. You want to only those who are in direct competition with existing broadcasting uh, broadcasters, with the uh, with the licensed broadcasters, and you want to have a threshold, a minimum threshold. I would think something like eighty hundred million dollars. Anything below, you don't really care. They are not a competition. They don't undermine the broadcasting system, and they may uh, st uh, foster innovation and find different ways of doing things that you don't want to suppress. So I think that's absolutely key that you first of all outline it to those who are in effect in direct competition with broadcasters and you have that threshold. Then what are the obligations you want to impose? You don't need to impose on them all the same obligation we do on broadcast as we do right now. And it would, would be a pro, uh, also inappropriate. What you want to is information requirements that uh, you want to make sure the, <clears throat> that uh, they uh, pay obviously the licensing fees or whatever of the CRTC that they that they contribute to Canadian funds that we have created, like the Canadian Media Fund, to make sure that there's money for Canadian productions. You might, might want to make sure that they have a minimum Canadian content offering, which should, should, they should be, have no problem doing with that. And also that it's discoverable so that if, when, if people want to find it, they can find it easily, etc. But we don't have this whole myriad of, of provisions that we have in the Broadcasting Act and the regulations which apply to appointment competition uh, uh, broadcasting. They make no sense in uh, for streamers and, you know, putting wanting to watch what you want, where you want, on whatever uh, device, at whatever time, etc. So you, all of that you don't need. If the key points that I just made, if you put those in there, that solution, then you have to have a huge problem with the US because you can, our, if you make them pay into certain fund, you also have to make sure, number one, you treat our Canadian streamers, and we have two of them, Illico, and, uh, and, show, and show me the same way as you treat uh, the others. You can't, they are right now working under a specified exemption order that would, would have to be repealed and you have to treat the Canadian streamers the same way as the US one. And then since if they have to contribute to the various funds, they should also be entitled to tip into them when they make productions. Right now, if Netflix makes a production in Canada using Canadian actors on a Canadian scene based on a Canadian book or something like that, they still couldn't access those because those funds have all the same provisions. The company has to be Canadian owned and controlled and it has to 
in own uh, the IP rights, uh, i.e. the copyright for the films. Now that uh, clearly, on the one hand, you say, set up this regime, you say you want to bring them in, you want them to pay, but to the extent that well, all of this in order to foster Canadian content, but if they want to produce Canadian content, they don't have access to the funds. That doesn't make sense. You, so you have to have to change that. And that's not going to be easy and there's going to be a lot of uh, 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 probably a resistance to it. Plus it will require legislation to change the Telephone Film Act and uh, to change the, uh, what, what's the other one? The, uh, the, the one that they deals with the, the terms and conditions for, uh, for the Canadian Media Fund. So, as I say, if you want, if that's your goal, you can do it, but you have to do it selectively, carefully, and making sure that you treat the foreigners no, no better, no worse than the, than the Canadian, and it's actually targeted for streamers, and that you, you do not uh, discriminate, uh, uh, in effect, stifle innovation by being overly broad. The way it is right now, the CRTC can ask pass a regulation requiring anybody who, who can be received in Canada to with voice and video to A, register and B, comply with whatever they want to because there's a huge series of powers that they've been given under the Broadcasting Act and it's up to them to decide who and what to exempt. Now, as a former regulator, let me tell you, when you exempt, you're very cautious. You only exempt what is absolute clear because you never know what we may come down the pike. And what's it. So the exemptions are not going to be broad, but now, and you just sweep everything in and then you say, it's a, that's the wrong way to go here. Just the opposite. You should be very narrow casting, going after this is what we're going after and the rest we don't touch. Mm -hmm. What you've been talking about here is mainly um, C10, which, um, uh, but what about C36, which was about online harms and which is in some ways an even hotter topic given well, political I, I, polarization, I, misinformation, and, um, uh, you know, the hate speech actually and the whole, the whole idea. range of things are bundled in there with some, you know, rather draconian measures. I know it's uh, we're trying to deal with what's called internet harms. They are not very specified, uh, clearly defined. First of all, and they have been, uh, there are six, five of them. They singled out child pornography, violence, inciting violence, inciting terrorism, intimate disclosure of uh, uh, disclosure of intimate uh, images, and hate mail. Assuming you can even define them narrowly, etc. What should be the regime and how do you want to control it? And this act basically imposes a regime or subdelegates that on the ISPs that they are supposed to control and make sure that there is none, none of this appears on the websites or if it is, they are, they are supposed to, uh, as a mechanism for taking it off, if somebody protests, you take it off. And then there's a dispute, and it can be reinstated if it indeed is harmless, or if not, if not, it stays off. The whole procedure is not really very clearly set out. It seems to be very draconian. There's no, no, there was no consultation on it. They pu published a consultation, which was basically based on the act as we see it. It was just yeah. question: Should we do this? Was, was what is in a nutshell what they said, and. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm stunned that they, they, they think, first of all, they wouldn't have huge problems in terms of shutter of rights. Secondly, why those uh, five uh, areas, are, uh, why are these particularly uh, singled out? Uh, thirdly, why is terrorism in there at all? These are supposed to be civil uh, procedures and civil penalties. Terrorism, as far as I'm concerned, has always been a, a criminal area. I not, don't understand why we need to go it after civilly. And then also, uh, basically, through the uh, backdoor, you're sli sliding in the whole concept of lawful access because you make these companies keep the records for up to a year so that you can, that they're accessible and they can be used in prosecution, etc. 
Well, this is what we have tried to do on the criminal side with terrorism and, and not successful in the past. The whole thing, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, I realize there's an issue there. It should be addressed. But the way the government goes about it, is, it seems to me, is, is ham-fisted. And, uh, and it will be, what will happen is obvious, people will play it safe. They will play, go on, this, on the safe side and over, uh, be overcautious okay. and remove things just in case it may be, uh, make them liable or they may be responded, et cetera. And I think it will be, we have a very large stifling effect. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, it, it won't surprise you in a, in a conversation series on freedom of expression that previous guests have, have raised some similar points um, about this uh, attempt to uh, or focus on dealing with the sort of harmful speech through restricting speech. Um, so the, our previous guest, uh, Jim L. Jaffer, and then before him, Taylor Owen, have, have both um, drawn attention to, 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 to that and suggested that um, more productive ways would be to uh, for making structural and design changes in the um, in the platforms themselves, um, including such things as reforming the algorithms of changing the business uh, uh, models that are based on surveillance and even um, restructuring um, corporations themselves. Uh, and this and the most, I guess, most prominent way that is at least being dealt with in the United States um, is through antitrust or what we call a competition law of, of, of breaking up the, uh, uh, some of these companies or at least bringing other aspects of competition law. And this um, draws on your experience as the, uh, as the head of the Competition Bureau and Commissioner. Um, so I, I be interested in what you make of those attempts in the in the U.S. to to deal with um, with the challenge of the of the platforms, um, particularly under what appears to be a, a re reform or a return to this to the original Sherman Act of of yes. looking at the sort of the democratic challenges that overly large and mon monopolistic uh, companies present. Do you, what what do you make of those developments and do you think those will be helpful? I hope so. I, th I think that's a very positive sign that it's actually being tried. And you, you and I talked about this before. I think the book by uh, Tim Wu was instrumental in, in really the pointing out, you know, how the... Would that be this uh, one, The Curse of Bigness? Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, Leela Khan has written that art article, you know, the case against Facebook, which got her appointed to the FTC. Uh, and or she's now doing Amazon. The... It was Amazon, I think. Amazon, sorry, so yes, there's um, another one on Facebook, which is also yeah, very right. good. Yeah. yeah, and she's she's now uh, bringing actions along those uh, lines. Uh, I'm not the Sherman Antitrust Act, of course, stems from a uh, yeah, very long time ago. Even the, it's the 19th century, not yeah. even the 20th century. And uh, can it be interpreted that way? Over the years, it has been completely gone the other way. It was all based on consumer consumer welfare. And if you mentioned the measured the consumer welfare essentially in terms of price for the consumer. Here we're talking about something, we're not talking about price. Nobody complains that Amazon is gouging. Amazon is anything but, it's, it's undercutting a lot of other people. But it also, it's ruining enough, a lot of other things. And can you, is the system capable of evolving in a through litigation and through court precedents in order to deal uh, with uh, the whole uh, internet and the dominance by the tech giants? I hope they were there, they, can, they can do it. Where I, it will be a long and tough slug. There's also, um, as you know, legislative action proposed in, in Congress and also in, in, the, in the EU, etc. And here in Canada, we are, our act is anything uh, but uh, receptive to the idea. I know the, the, uh, there have been a couple of papers and studies saying it could be used to that purpose. Actually, our 
competition so far has been anything but adventurous, but been very traditional, very straightforward, et cetera, and, 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 and looking at it. And I can't see the development. Also, we don't litigate litigation as that much as to evolve it that way, partially because the litigation monopoly rests with the commissioner. You know, they have the private actions under the Competition Act are very limited to very few. And the main provision on, on, on abuse of dominance does not allow private parties to bring action and they can also get, get nobody can get damages. So why would you would you litigate yeah. it? So you yeah. ask the commissioner to litigate it, and the commissioner can litigate, he can obtain uh, injunctions uh, and orders, he can even uh, issue uh, 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 administrative penalties, but the whole structure, the way it is, in, uh, is wasn't sought out and conceived that way. On the contrary, we have this big provision in there, the so-called efficiency defense, yeah. you know, whereby something that is anti-competitive but efficient can survive and can be approved or must be approved to be be exact. So uh, I think we. Uh, Competition will be part of the answer. We will need to amend our Competition Act very substantially. And I'm glad to see that our Commission of Competition has said the same thing. But mm -hmm. uh, I think the uh, coming back to where we started out, I think it's not a competition issue. We're trying to put these things into existing silos. This is, is something that is so wide and has so many aspects of it so that I don't think one single tool is the answer. Yeah, no, on that, I, I certainly I, I agree with, with, with you. Um, it's going to take a comprehensive but multi-pronged uh, approach, but, but um, we, <laughs> in the short term, we've only got the tools that we have ar around. Yeah. And so it seems to me that you need to both consider strengthening the existing tools and then at the same time and in parallel figure out a regulatory regime that's appropriate to to the to the big platforms and and so far we're we're not even at at square one in 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 that discussion it seems to to, to me um, no, so I agree with you. We have to push on all fronts, and every existing lever that lever that we have should be used. No, no question about that. Yeah, I, I presume that in, in Canada, even in an optimistic um, frame, we wouldn't be able to um, use competition law to, to actually force separations um, like of Facebook. The mo that's the most common one that's proposed of, of breaking off WhatsApp and, and Instagram from the main Facebook. Um, you know, dealing with Google would be would be different, but we're, we're not going to be able to, to, to do much in that regard. Um, what do you think we, we could do? I mean, I mean, um, conceptually speaking, you could actually do. I mean, the, the act allows for the if you bring an abuse of dominance case and made it out, etc., and you could ask as one of the remedies being a separation of the company and etc. Mm -hmm. But the likelihood of getting it is probably next to zero. But anyway, it's, it is it is conceivably possible. Yeah. My understanding is, is that the Competition Bureau, its budget has recently been increased to something like $27 million a year. Um, and so that which is peanuts um, if to, to take on a, a legal challenge to Facebook or any of these other gi giants um, would be overwhelming in, in terms of the, the expense for, for that. Um, you're, you're absolutely right there, and uh, that's for, and I've always never understood why we do not allow private action in Canada. And that if you are harmed by anti-competitive conduct, why can't you go to court and fight and get compensated? We do it with everything else, but not with comp anti-competitive con uh, conduct. Yeah. If if, uh, if if a business suffers from the activities of it of its competitors. Which are not has nothing to do with competition, but whatever action they, uh, that person does, you, of course you can take him to court, and you can argue. And if we did open it up, we would have actually the evolution of competition legislation in Canada, and would create probably better, more jurisprudence, etc. As it is right now, Canadian jurisprudence on on competition is pretty sparse. 
Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, look at, um, well, you mentioned common carrier um, yeah. previously. And um, one of the, the obstacles, it seems to me, uh, about regulating um, uh, the tech giants, um, the, the platforms, is um, that at least in the United States, their 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 actions are, are protected under the Communications Decency Act, and in particular the Section uh, Two Thirty that, uh, and I'll quote: "No provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as a publisher or speaker of any information provided by another information content provider," um, which in some ways looks a, a lot like car common carrier protection. That, mm. Um, but at the same time, um, they are um, actually, as you were saying earlier, they're curating much of that content. And so they've got the best of both worlds in terms of, the, of, of um, being able to say what they want but, um, and having uh, an editorial shaping influence, but they can't be um, held to account for that. Uh, and my understanding is that you've, you've commented that under the... Um, the the current free trade agreement with the U.S. and, and Mexico, which you helped uh, negotiate, um, that clause is built into the agreement, and um, and so um, how do we how would we even change that? I know in the U.S. Congress there are attempts to to take that apart um, and hold them more to account for what they're responsible for, um, but um, I wonder what you think about that. Honestly, I I have not uh, I've seen the clause like everything in trade agreement. It's uh, this is trade law, which is slightly different than than ordinary law because you always not only look at the law but uh, the trade provisions, but the effect. And the the, the, the whole idea is that it, never mind what it says on its face and how it feels. Does is the effect of it a, a violation of uh, one of the two principles or underlying trade agreements? Uh, you obviously, uh, and uh, I'm not so sure if we, uh, you couldn't construct a regime that would get around the, uh, the Canada, US, Mexico agreement. It also, but far more important is what would you actually do? What would the regime look like? I mean, as you mentioned, uh, these are common carriers, but they curate. curate. So they, they have the best of both worlds. Now, another, in, in, let's say in stick with the Canadian system. Either they are telecom carriers and they can't touch the content, or they're content providers, and then you have to comply by the rules that we have for content, assuming you fall under. They don't fall under them. And C10 is, uh, is, a, is an attempt to bring them under it. But once if you're saying no we lift this common care you have an obligation to do a b and c what are the obligations and also what are the consequences and what are the liabilities for them and what's the liabilities for them for them vis-a-vis -vis the content that they curate and the producers and the owners of that content all of this has to be sort of conceptually thought through, and it hasn't. And I haven't heard anybody really quite suggest how we, the best or the latest uh, attempt of it's of obviously what the Europeans are trying to do with the Digital Media, Media Act and saying, you know, let's look at them by size and treat different one have different obligations and different, yeah, that may be an approach uh, to, to take with it. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively is to uh, force them to, uh, you could go the Australian way, where they have this voluntary quote, uh, this principle of voluntary codes of conduct, that you go to the industry and say, this is a problem, we will resolve, if, uh, come up with a, with a code of conduct that deals with the problem, put it forward to us for approval, we'll have a public hearing and a public discussion, will probably be changed, etc. But once we can, you know what your business, you know what's best to you know. We, by our job is to protect the public. So you bring your expertise, we bring your expertise, and as a result of it, we come up with something that you can live with, but on the other hand, protect the public. There might be a, a, another way of approaching it, but 
I think the time has come that we re recognize in the fact that the provisions that you just read or the Canadian version of the common carrier principle, etc., is just not applicable to social media. Yeah, but it appears to <laughs> effectively to, to, to be, be that way. Um, so uh, one of the proposals um, and particularly uh, coming from, from Europe under the, uh, the general data protection yeah. um, regulation, GDPR, is for the accountability around the algorithms that, are, that um, companies use. Um, and that's, um, some people are suggesting that making those algorithms more, more transparent so that we know in the case of, of social media companies, how they, they recommend and reinforce and promote and amplify um, particular messages and, and steer people into um, you know, particular groups or affiliations. Um, that is a con significant contributor to some of the, mis the spread or at least the scope and the, the range of misinformation um, of, you know, politically polarizing speech and, and things like that. So, so rather than restrict the, the speech is, is ensure that it is not um, uh, amplified simply for the interests of the platforms themselves, that, that there, there needs to be an, a public interest accountability. Do you, do you see any promise in, in that? And, and that's also actually also one of the measures that in a very more, much more limited way, unfortunately, in the recent C11, the reform to the to our privacy legislation is to have some degree of algorithmic transparency. It doesn't have much teeth and doesn't go very far, but, but that's one of the other approaches. You know, I think that uh, clearly uh, algorithms, uh, after what do they do? They take data that doesn't belong to the company, which is actually data from the user, yes. and then Absolutely. curate it to a certain effect. And, and, and the, the effect of, of obviously is geared to maximizing income. I, I think forcing them to account, explain, and, and, and uh, <clears throat> if necessary, change the algorithm are all perfect ideas. How do how you actually do it? You know, and it is 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 another story because essentially. All of this, is, we are talking about uh, artificial intelligence, you know, and, and, and so you, are you going to have artificial intelligence, monitoring artificial intelligence, or are you going to ask them to demonstrate what they're doing by, by results? Or oh, I'm, I'm quite, I like the idea. I, I like always, I've tried when somebody comes forward with a good idea, I try to say, how would it actually be implemented? How would you operate it? And I feel uh, this is not, go uh, not going to be easy to figure out a way to make them accountable. I like the concept. I see some problems with the implementation. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the ways, not directly at the algorithms, but that's been proposed by the um, Nobel um, uh, laureate uh, economist Paul Romer, which is to uh, require a tax on targeted uh, digital advertising uh, for companies of larger than a certain amount, um, much like you were proposing um, of um, you know, $100 million or something. And that um, would, would provide a, a, at least a serious break on using um, algorithms that uh, rely on the expropriation of inf personal information and then of, of curating it for targeting um, to, uh, to, to, to users. Um, it doesn't get at the algorithm directly, but, but it would certainly um, sort of slow down the, uh, that, that uh, vicious cycle of, of, of financial interest in, in amplifying uh, mess, uh, messages and and uh, uh, you know basically trying to keep people engaged on the site by through a, a you know emotionally or you know triggering content to keep them clicking i may just if, uh, if it's a tax it may also may just become a cost of doing business you know that's the the downside i would much rather go the other way and suggest that you know 
look, the data doesn't belong to you. The data belongs to the user. You, you are handling the data. You are using the data to generate mm -hmm. tremendous income. You have a fiduciary duty. Mm -hmm. may, may some, you know, try to, it's a bad analogy, but the only one you can think of is banks. Banks handle your money, but they have a fiduciary duty to handle it in a certain way, etc. Could we say here, you social media company, you get all this media, all this data, and you use it, and you use it successfully, etc. But here are certain rules what you have to do. And one of them would be what you just mentioned before, for instance, make your algorithms available to subject, demonstrate that they do this and they don't do that, right. etc. So, so, so start off with saying, this is, let's, let's face it, your wealth comes not from you, comes from other, assembling the data from other people. It is not your data. So therefore, it follows that if you use this data, these are some of the obligations that you pick up. Yeah, well, that's certainly what, what I and a number of other um, privacy advocates would like to see the reform of our privacy legislation go for, um, yeah. particularly to, to ch challenge the business model that underlies these incredibly large and lucrative um, you know, data exploitation, personal data exploitation um, uh, engines. Um, so uh, I, I quite agree with, with, with that. Um, just um, oh, what is Go back to what you were talking about um, at the beginning. Um, you were mentioning a royal commission yeah. um, to to look into this. Uh, when um, you were uh, just as you were leaving your position as the chair of the CRTC, you were you were interviewed by the Globe and Mail, and um, you were reported as, as saying, and I, I quote the the article. Um, that the regulatory system for the CRTC regulated broadcasting and telecom is antiquated and requires legislative renewal and institutional reorganization to keep up with the new technology. Um, and that was back in 2012 before um, I'd say public opinion soured a bit on the big tech platform. So um, could, could you say a bit more about sure. what you think are the, are the prospects and how to go about that kind of, of reform? Um, well, I, I think, for, first of all, uh, we have, as I mentioned earlier, we have three decision makers here, the Minister of Industry, the Minister of Heritage, and CRTC. And uh, the emphasis throughout has been on uh, Canadian culture, Canadian identity, Canadian values, etc. And I'm not in any way diminishing the importance of that. But that was in those days when broadcasting was primarily the main means of communicating values, images, etc. Nowadays, in the day of internet, that doesn't make sense at all. It also doesn't make sense that wireless is controlled by the minister, but wireline by the, by, by the CRTC. Uh, and I think the whole institutional setup has to be Resort. I think you have to separate broadcasting from the internet. I mean, broadcasting is has one of what we mean by broadcasting, i.e., the creation, reflection of Canadian values and 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 scenes, etc. That is one task, but that is not the internet. The digital challenge, what we are looking at, etc., is far bigger, far more. And we always look at one through the prism of the other. We did it when we created the Department of Communications. We did it when we created the CRTC, which started as a broadcaster and was added telecom, etc. And we still do it today when we're trying to bring forward C10. We're trying to always have this is a prism through which we regard the world. I think that has to be changed. And you also have to, to the institutional arrangement. Why do we not have a minister for the internet or for the digital challenge, I would call it, the minister for the digital, so that we have one center where you bring together all the thoughts and the initiative. Right now, we have the minister of industry, we have the minister of heritage, we have, the, have several ministers having a responsibility to push in a, the infrastructure for the internet and, and internet communications out, etc. It's... I really think 
this issue is so important for our future, for our for 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 our uh, prospering and making making use of the internet and not and, and not suffering from the negative that it needs a rethink on the institutional side as well as purely on the conceptual and legislative side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll you'll remember, of course, that there was a, a minister of communication, yes. um, and which was um, then um, that ministry was broken apart into heritage and and industry, and and in some ways, I th I think up till then, um, uh, Canadian policy for for many decades um, was was very much uh, attuned to the to the role that communication networks play in maintaining a Canadian identity and sovereignty of uh, uh, promoting a Canadian culture in the face of, of our yeah. of our neighbor to the south and so on. And so I guess, uh, I mean, I, I think of this as a notion of, of, uh, of, of network sovereignty of the ability of a nation to see what it, it um, uh, to advance the public interest. Uh, that Canadians need to exercise effective control over their communication networks in, in various facets uh, upon which the social, economic, and cultural life of the nation depends. So um, that seems to be, is, has been a longstanding guiding principle in Canadian policy, um, certainly um, uh, beginning with radio in the 1920s and draws on a heritage from the railways of, of the nas national dream of, of connecting Canada across um, its so many time zones and across this vast space um, as a that, that, that communication networks and, 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 and policy and institutions were integral to, to the creation and maintenance of, of Canada. Do you think that that, that ideal is still viable um, at this point? Um, I mean, I, I think it is, but, but it certainly faces some challenges. It's absolutely viable on the, on the cultural side and, and on, on the, uh, for lack of a, on the broadcasting side, et cetera. But I'm not so sure that it really makes sense on the, on the communication side. I know for what I call in the internet side, the internet age. Let's forget that, you know, one of the other things about the internet is that it erases boundaries. And on top of it, we live in North America, and as I don't have to tell you, you know, we are very much tied to what goes on in the States, etc. So that ideal, the way you expressed it, I think was perfectly fine in the in the in the last century, in the 1980s, 90s. Now it has to be sort of cut back and uh, reduced uh, to the expression side, the identity side, the cultural side, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, on the technological side and on, on, on the many impacts that the, uh, uh, that so is the internet has on every facet of life, we should not look at it through that prism. We should look at it, you know, what, what, to how to, this is huge phenomena is here. How can we take advantage of it? Okay. Well, um, I would love to have a longer discussion and 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 debate that, but I think we're going to run out of time, and we yeah. we need to hear from um, people who are um, listening and paying attention. And uh, so, my last question. Well, just those who, who have questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom. I see there are already some questions there, but uh, certainly would welcome more. Um, so put in your questions and uh, Ange shortly will we'll, um, be selecting from them to, to, to offer to this. So, but my last question to you, um, Conrad, is what sort of resources or books or videos or movies even um, that would you recommend to to our listeners and viewers that might help give them some you know more insight and background into this do you have any favorites well you mentioned before tim Wu's book i thought that that was really an eye opener for for many of us uh, to, to 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 see uh, how anti has uh, departed from its original way and and how it could could or should be brought back into being more than just a, an issue of consumer health welfare based on price. I think that's the, the, that's 
a, a very good uh, way to understand that aspect of this. Of the, the other one, if, I mean, I, I find there's such... There isn't a sort of, that's probably the problem, is there's not a single book, I would think, that, that, that shows all the many aspects of, uh, of the internet and uh, what it can do. I mean, I remember reading books about, uh, uh, this is how Google does it, etc. Fascinating, etc. cetera, or, or the, the long tail, you know, when it, there's a book about Amazon, etc. But that was all at the beginning. And, but since then, there have been so many more in such a multiplicity of it. Yeah, that, uh, I think like you, you Probably like me and Tobias, we all struggle to just to keep up to what's going on and understanding yeah. it. I'm, I'm not so sure I, I can point to, to, to something specific and saying that's an absolute must read for everybody. Okay. Well, um, I, uh, I, I appreciate that the difficulty of, of coming up with that. I was, I was just, uh, you know, uh, hoping that you might have something, but, uh, but certainly that uh, the, 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 the the scope the complexity the the, the pace of change um, all makes this extremely challenging but as you've said repeatedly this is of vital importance and and um, and we shouldn't throw our hands up of, as it being you know too difficult to address I, I think there's lots of things that that we can do and we have to put our minds to it and so I, I really appreciate the, 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 what you've been able to help us with so far. Um, so I'd like to open this up to, to questions and and Anjan, uh, what could you give us a first question? Uh, yeah, before I go to the first question, I wanted to share a comment from Michael Geist. Uh, Michael says, just to be clear, C36 was not online harms legislation. It was limited to online hate. The online harms proposal was never introduced as a bill, just a consultation. Government has signaled they plan more consultation. The reaction was very negative. Would either of you like to comment on that before I go on to the first question? Well, Michael's absolutely well, right. Thank you, right, Michael. Yeah, yeah. he's much. absolutely right. I mean, the, the government had a consultation on online harms. They never introduced it. It was a consultation that was, seemed to be based on an existing draft, but the draft has never been made pub public. And, uh, and uh, hopefully the government will rethink this issue before they reintroduce it. Indeed. Yes, uh, but they've said that this is a high priority and uh, I really hope that they're taking some time <laughs> about this to rethink it. Okay, next question, Ange. Okay, the next question from Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie says, during a recent uh, telephone briefing on online harms legislation, uh, it was clear that many groups who felt prejudice and discrimination had been invited to participate without in any way minimizing the very serious issues that have been highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement and other recent tragedies of hate crime. Do you have any suggestions for the government on how to consult impacted groups while also strengthening robust free speech? I mean, I think one of the obvious way to do it is to use the uh, the internet. I mean, we have this tool; we can reach everybody, etc. So, do to uh, the uh, consultation that we, we do them right now is the government issues its proposals, and then uh, people bring in their in their their views, but I have never seen a, a further one using this then to bring together all the various things electronically and having something like an electronic for town hall or discussion on this, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to me that uh, until now, most of the discussions are really uh, paper discussions and uh, you, you put an electronic version out and you get an electronic uh, response and then you then treat it as if it was paper. Uh, it, it, it's, I haven't seen really an imaginative and, and uh, innovative use of the internet for in order to obtain a broader public input and discussion. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah. And, yeah, well, well, certainly, um, 
the internet does provide important new um, means for having uh, public discussions um, that are are can be widespread and focused and having you know particular groups uh, coalesce around particular issues and, and so on. Um, I, I wouldn't want to dismiss um, con more conventional means of consultation. I mean, Canada has a, a long history of of some excellent public consultations, and you've mm -hmm. mentioned public, you know, uh, royal commissions. I think of the uh, the commission that um, in the 1920s that uh, basically helped establish the the, the, CR, the CBC um, and the, the Aired Commission, which in the course of nine months um, went f across the country by by train, uh, held multiple. Um, hearings in various cities, they received hundreds of submissions, and and um, on the basis of that, they formulated um, Canadian broadcasting policy or the foundations of that that still stand to this day. For instance, so that the airways be um, treated as public po uh, pro public property. Um, that, uh, as you've been talking about, of Canadian uh, cultural identity was an important aspect of, of that. Um, so that was a conventional medium. Um, the Berger commissions around the Mackenzie Valley pipeline um, brought together uh, technical experts and uh, indigenous um, land experts. Uh, they were televised and and produced, um, got a lot of attention and and I, th I think create a, a kind of a, a public, Around those, that that issue that uh, that uh, uh, I think engaged a lot of people. If the government was serious about this, I think there's lots of means um, of uh, having uh, public consultations that that involve a hybrid of of in person and um, and you know internet mediated communications. And there there are organizations in Canada that that do have experience um, in such uh, consultation. So so I think the, the problem is is the, the will um, to actually uh, conduct something. Um, but it's a risk politically, I suppose, because you don't know what might come out of it and it might not be what's um, in public policy, the, the current policy. So um, a bit more transparency would also help. I mean, yes. I don't understand why we have consultations where submissions are not being made public afterwards, as we have uh, several ones of uh, recently, you know, where you want to see the submissions of the people made it and uh, you only hear that it's here it afterwards. The BTLR is a perfect example, you know, all the submissions of the BTLR, you have to actually go. What was the past. BTLR? The uh, Broadcast and Telecom Legislative Review. There wasn't one website where you could find all the submissions, you know. I just don't understand yeah. why submissions aren't automatically made public. Yeah, I share that concern with you. And I, I know that uh, Michael Geist has made um, public the submissions to, I forget which um, consultation it was. The yeah. Ontario government recently held public consultations on its white paper for modernizing the privacy law. Um, and those submissions were not um, made public automatically, and, and sort of peeved by that, I I've issued a made a freedom of information request for all of the submissions, and I've got half of them so far, and I'll be making them public um, later this month so that we can at least see that and and save the government the work of having to go through an FOI process to to make public what already has been uh, submitted as part of a public consultation. So I quite agree with you. It's 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 a, the it's irony a public consultation, but you don't make the submissions public. <laughs> yeah, so we got a long way way, way to go. Um, uh, Ange, do you have another question? Uh, yeah, the next question uh, is from Mary, and Mary uh, says, in terms of possible reforms to the Canadian competition laws, what are your thoughts on following the UK's competition and market authority and paying financial rewards to whistleblowers who risk their careers by exposing cartels to the government uh, competition regulators? The Ontario Securities Commission and Canadian Canada Revenue Agency both pay rewards to whistleblowers exposing securities laws violations and offshore tax evasion, respectively. 
Given the role Facebook whistleblowers Frances Haugen and Sophie Zhang have played in exposing issues at Facebook, shouldn't Canada be doing more to encourage whistleblowers? Absolutely. I don't see any any problem with uh, putting a regime in there. Yeah, as you know, if um, whistleblowing uh, is, is usually is connected to crimes, and, uh, what, what Facebook was doing is but it's not criminal, I and mean, it may not be what you want. So you have to be careful about how you word uh, uh, whistleblowing here. It has to be a contra, I have to say at least a contravention of uh, of certain rules, etc. And I also get the question of where, what are the rewards and how, but in, 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 in principle, the principle of establishing uh, whistleblowers, I think is good as it is right now, most of the times when you have a cartel, the whistleblower is an, is a, is an aggrieved employee who was, was left out or wasn't promoted or something like that and comes forward. That's where you get your original leads on cartels. And it, if, if, and there undoubtedly, there are lots of cartels that are not being, being, uh, being this, uh, or, or a lot of anti-competitive activity that's not being dis uh, disclosed. And there are anything to encourage disclosure, I think, would be beneficial. Um, I can also add that the Center for Free Expression, the, the host of this series, has a, an active um, um, initiative around uh, whistleblower protection. Um, there are proposals for, for legislation and various other forms of, of support um, for whistleblowers um, and calling for um, policies that uh, institutions need to develop around, uh, in, around protection of, of, of whistleblowers. It's, it, we, we find that so much of the most important things that have been revealed about um, government and corporate um, uh, actions have come from whistleblowers and not through the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the more expected or usual um, means of investigative journalism or academics or researchers and, and things like that. So whistleblowers are increasingly important and, and certainly need to be you know, protected and the CFE is, is, um, is on the case in that regard. Um, Angie, do we have another question? Uh, yeah, I do want to remind uh, attendees to please use the Q&A button if they have any more questions. Uh, the next question is from Garth, and Garth asks, asks what will ensure that uh, data actually does belong to the user? Uh, I'm not sure quite how to, why would it not belong to the user? I mean, it is the user's data. He is, he is the one who furnishes it, uh, it's, if, if anything, a question is, does, does the data furnisher lose ownership when his data is curated? That might, it might be an issue, but as it seems to me, <laughs> the data that you furnish to a social media company is still your data. And in that can, uh, it is certainly starts out with being your data and it can, can it be established by law that it in effect remains your data. Or, 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 when it, or especially pointing out when it is no longer your data, etc. But at the starting out point has to be that the data furnished by a user is his data. I don't see where, where there's any, can be any doubt about that. Yeah, well, if maybe to add to, to that, um, it's not quite clear what uh, Garth is getting at in terms of, of um, of, of, of what he means by belonging, but one interpretation is um, is the, the 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 effective right to that your information you know belongs to you and in the sense of that you have control over it, and that is something that's come up with the proposals for the reform of of our privacy law, PIPEDA, and if uh, many um, privacy advocates are trying to. Um, have established in law that uh, privacy is a human right. And that means that the individuals, the data about that individual, um, uh, the, 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 their sort of rights to that uh, 
um, trump or override the commercial interests of of exploiting that and at this point my understanding of of the of of Pipita is that it's it balance there's a there's an attempt to balance commercial interests in in um, making you know commercial use of of information with the, the with the rights to the individual so the so there's a there's there's an ambiguity there as to which takes precedence, um, uh, the the personal or the or the corporate in in these in these settings, and and I think that it would help to have more clearly defined in, in law that uh, privacy is a human right, and and that that commercial rights are are secondary and. Do not get traded off against them. So I don't know if that answers or addresses this, the core of of Garth's question. But um, and can we have a, another question? Uh, yeah, the next question is from Jamie. Uh, Jamie asks, uh, my question goes back to online harms plans of the federal government. It seems indisputable that the federal government already has decided precisely how it will proceed with regard to legislation to deal with online harms, making a talk, making talk of consultation a bad joke. It made this clear before the election and in the mandate letters from the prime minister following the election. In this circumstance, should we participate in whatever consultation they propose or should we set up an alternative civil society process? <coughs> well, I, 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 the question presupposes an, an outcome and then, then ask people how we should deal with that outcome. I'm not so sure that the government will proceed with, with the original uh, discussion. I think they will have some serious uh, rethinking about it. I mean, I know it's mentioned in the uh, uh, mandate letter. There was also talk about uh, bringing it back within 100 days. I haven't, I haven't heard anything, any more mention of that. And I think the discussion and the feedback they got on that original discussion paper surely will make them rethink. And I think with any discussion that you can, anything that you can do to attenuate or make these things better is worthwhile rather than having to fight civil action against an existing law. And I mean, I've, what I've never quite understood about this government's plan and they have never really pointed out what is the end effect if somebody doesn't comply, if there is, a harmful harm. It is held harmful harm. You have a you have a dispute resolution that it is harm, and the person still 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 keeps having that harmful content on a, on its website. Are we then going to resort to internet blocking? Is that the ultimate? Is that what the ISPs will have to do, etc.? Yeah, it has never been quite uh, uh, quite clarified, and I think. If, <clears throat> participating in discussions with the government on uh, when they come forward with another post, uh, discussion or proposal or green paper, whatever they do, uh, is very worthwhile. And we should push on points such as this, you know, where is all this leading? What are you really trying to achieve here? Andrew? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. maybe you could... Uh, okay. That next question. Uh, and maybe yeah. we'll come back to consultation later. Okay. Uh, the next question from an attendee, uh, they say a uh, timely and important discussion, perhaps too strongly focused on failures on the part of government and industry. Are these failures not ultimately rooted in the indifference and complacency of Canadian telecom consumers, most of whom remain willfully disengaged from issues that relate directly and profoundly to their own welfare and prosperity? <laughs> Interesting question. I think it takes uh, obviously the necessary spark to uh, to get, uh, get consumer interest. I think of C10, which basically was sleepwalking its way until the government, what Michael Geist describes as kicking an own, own goal, deleted the, uh, the provisions regarding uh, user furnished content, content. And then suddenly this whole thing went up. So I think if you, the, by and large, the general public is uh, relatively uh, passive on these issues. But given uh, the right issue or the point, people pointing out, 
is the possible very negative consequence on something like this. So you uh, you can get a phenomenal consumer uh, uh, reaction. And I mean, that's how it is with most other things too, not only with the, uh, with telecom. I mean, uh, by and large, people do not pay great attention to what's before Parliament and what goes forward until this is an issue that happened touches them directly or touches something which is like hold ink of great value and uh, they want to see preserved or, or nurtured. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that and going back to the to the previous question, the, de the degree to which people are in, involved um, depends a great deal on the, um, well, on what the, how the government uh, views uh, citizens and how corporations view their their consumers and to whether um, inviting participation in an ongoing way that is effective so that people can see the consequences um, see, see that when their voices are, are heard um, I would say it would be a, a healthier way to treat this and what we see now is both governments and corporations often, you know, hiding um, and and trying to make boring um, what what they're doing, and then, as you said, sort of the own goal of of making the mistake of of do, saying something or doing something that then gets people all excited, so it's, uh, and and comes back at them, and so they're even more shy the next time to 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 put anything out there. I think that. The, that there needs to be a, a much stronger habit of making things, you know, issues visible and relatable um, to people's lives in a way that they can engage in it in an ongoing fashion, rather than the sort of episodic um, scandals or crises that get people all suddenly all excited about a, a, a narrow issue. And and um, and this is going to be necessary if we're going to deal with the the internet issues in a sufficiently comprehensive way that we can make some you know progress on that so. <coughs> and uh, next next question uh yeah the next question uh it's another one from stephanie uh stephanie says if the government did introduce and pass some kind of hate or harms legislation what oversight model could you imagine Several of us benefited from a grant from the Office of the Privacy Commissioner to look at concepts of a digital trust. I have been looking at models of independent oversight of certain internet institutions, uh, notably ICANN, that could benefit from independent oversight from experts. Do you have any thoughts on such a body that might actually look structurally like the CRTC in terms of regional and expertise balance? That ICANN is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, the okay. regulation body of um, the, for the internet plumbing, so they so to speak. But go ahead, um, Conrad. Well, clearly the oversight body sh should have expertise. I find that uh, we are the, right now the various oversight bodies. For, let's take the CRTC or so. There is no minimum requirement. There's no, require, you know, you can appoint anybody who you want to the government. Obviously, doesn't do that. They obviously appoint people who have the requisite back, background and, uh, or they think they have the requisite. They don't always achieve that. I think it's very useful if the act specifies uh, for the oversight one the criteria of that, and that you can mix it. Like when if we're talking about something like privacy, obviously you want privacy experts, but you also want technological experts, you want legal experts, and then you have a good mixture of that. We generally leave it up to the governor in general at, at completely to decide who sits on these oversight bodies. In some rare instances, like the copyright board, you there's a provision that the chairman has to be a retired judge or a sitting judge, but more by and large. We don't specify any criteria, and that can, of course, lead to the appointments which are either not qualified or but are appointed for political reasons rather than capacity reasons. And so I think that that would be, uh, I would very strongly urge to specify it. I don't know whether I, I can, uh, I'm quite familiar with I can, but it, it obviously has not a lot of expertise. But it's not a government body. It's as, as you know, it's it's the 
sort of self-regulating body uh, and it it's driven by its member and it works does wonderful work and everybody on there knows their stuff etc i'm not so sure how you can recreate that kind of atmosphere in a government appointed oversight body and next 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 question uh yeah the next question uh from marita uh Rita says, as already mentioned, the internet knows no borders, which makes it difficult, maybe impossible to successfully solve problems with national legislation. To what extent do we need to be working with the with other nations to solve internet related problems? Conrad? Well, I, it's true that the internet knows no boundaries, but we can see you can still have national legislation and you can enforce that national legislation. After all, uh, lots of countries do it because access to the internet is through ISPs. Mm -hmm. You know, we have you have control over the ISPs, and you can uh, can provide what they may or may not do, etc. And I mean, there's some very negative examples. The you know, like China, for instance, etc. <laughs> um, but you could also think of positive ones. So I think national legislation has its place, but it should obviously be watching what other nations do and to, to the, at large extent to make sure that they're compatible, that we don't work at cross purposes and that we follow all, certainly all the Western democracies, follow the same rule and work together and work this out. And as you know, many there are lots of initiatives going on all over the place. And for instance, the whole idea of, of internet uh, service tax you know, it's being discussed at great length at the OECD, et cetera. And the way Canada is now unilaterally going forward, but if there is a, a common OECD solution, I'm sure we will adopt it, et cetera. So to some extent, you sometimes use national legislation to push others to come up to international. Others, you work, uh, depending what the issue is, you work on international basis and then implement it locally. But I think that's, uh, if it's overstating to say that, there's no role for national legislation. Yeah. Just to <laughs> add to that, um, uh, I, while, while I, I agree that the, um, the internet knows no boundaries is uh, a kind of a vision of the internet, it's, uh, I think it's, a, it's an internet myth um, and it has some basis, but, but of course, every physical device um, has territory. And even and data always has location, and those define what are the the legal, um, constitutional, jurisdictional um, rules that that apply. There's, it, the data is always in some jurisdiction, and I think this is a you know an issue for 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 Canada when so much of our data goes to the United States, where it loses uh, our legal and constitutional protections. And and there are all kinds of measures um, that we could take in order to um, to ensure that it's better protected rather than just throw up our hands and say, well, it's out of our, our jurisdiction, so we can't do anything. As Conrad's saying that there's, there's, I think there's plenty that national governments can do if they have the, the, the will to, uh, to do it. And they are beginning to, to do that as they see that there are problems with a, with a totally unregulated um, space here. Um, we have time, I think, for one quick question here. So Ange, can you? Um, yep. Uh, the next question is from Garth. Uh, Garth says, Canadian consultations on telecommunications and the internet, beginning with the first one on the in information highway, have concluded that public policy is market-based without reference to any broader public interest. How could a broad quote-unquote prism break that focus? Okay, great question. Uh Needs, needs a lot more well, than five, five, five minutes to answer that? it. Can you repeat that, Ange? I'm not quite sure I followed it. Uh, yeah, uh, Garth says, uh, Canadian consultations on telecommunications and the internet, beginning with the first one on the information highway, have concluded that public policy is market-based without reference to any broader public interest. How could a broad quote-unquote prism break that focus? Well, I'm not so, not so sure that uh, I stay, I agree with the uh, with the introduction that uh, the information highway only looked at the commercial side, but surely it, 
uh, if you look at uh, how would you break this, if we go by uh, the whole idea, let's say, of, an, uh, of a royal commission, it would depend who you point to it. And it also depends, first of all, make sure that you bring to, to it people from with expertise from the various aspect, walks of life that are affected by by the internet and also by the terms of reference how you were uh, how you uh, cast the terms of reference it, 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 i think uh, it, it very much depends on on how you set the thing up how wide it is and that brings in it's not it doesn't necessarily have to be limited purely to commercial uh, uh, aspects and, and industrial aspects of telecommunications you can certainly uh, widen the scope considerably through both in terms of reference and the people you appoint um just to 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 add to that i mean i uh the the discussions in the 1990s about the information highway through the information highway advisory councils had a, a, a rather broad um, scope there, but I agree that generally since then it's been sort of commercial interests that have been the primary um, driver of of, uh, of regulation and uh, attempts to to, uh, to steer internet um, activities. So, for instance, the Personal Information Protection Electronic Electronic Documents Act, um, PIBIDA from that time, defines explicitly as its purpose uh, to promote um, electronic commerce by providing some privacy measures. So I think that's sort of a clear indication of where the priority is. Um, I'd say unfortunately, but maybe necessarily, the way to break that um, that group that perspective is uh, through pointing out the shortcomings, the, the, the problems, and um, in some ways, almost the, the, the crises that come from that view exclusively, because this I see is, is what has enabled the tech giants to within an extraordinarily short period of time to rise, rise to such dominance. And now there is uh, real scrutiny coming um, to their activities, uh, their, their harms, and then not forgetting their, their, their benefits. And that I think is a hopeful point uh, right now that we are beginning that discussion. And I hope <laughs> that today's discussion has, has contributed in a small way to that. So I think on that note, um, I thank you very much, uh, Conrad. And um, I'll turn this um, back to, uh, to, uh, to Jim in, in a moment. I just want to say that we are going to or Ange is going to post the the this recording on our on the CFE website tomorrow, and um, also on the YouTube channel. And um, I hope that you will stay tuned for next week um, when I'll be talking with Wendy Chun, who is a, a Canada 150 Research Chair in New Media at Simon Fraser University, where she heads the Digital Democracies Institute. We're going to be talking about. Um, uh, how to achieve democracy uh, in the face of of, um, of the, the challenges of, of big tech. Uh, and uh, that's on the, going to be on the 18th um, at the same time. So um, thank you, Conrad. I, I think this is an excellent thank talk. You. I've learned much and, um, and thanks for the questions and thanks for your attention. Um, and um, thanks, Ange, and over to you, uh, Jim. Well, I'd like to join uh, Conrad. I would like to join Andrew and thank you. I think this has been a most engaging, informative and enlightening session. And we really appreciate you sharing your time with us. And thank you, Andrew, for the questions and uh, uh, contribution to that conversation and to putting together this whole series. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, um, next Tuesday, January 18th, we will be uh, dealing with the next in this series on Taming Big Tech. And as you mentioned, it's Wendy Chun, uh, Canada Research Chair at uh, Simon Fraser University, who will be our guest uh, discussing how to reclaim digital platforms for democracy in Canada. Um, for more information about this series and about all the other um, uh, panels and uh, conversations the center has, you can go to the center's website, which is cfe.ryerson.ca where there's a complete list and, and uh, links to all the videos of the previous sessions, 
as well as to our upcoming programs over the next month or two. So again, cfe.ryerson.ca. Finally, I'd just like to mention that with regard to the issue of online harms, uh, which the Center for Free Expression is taking very seriously, we have put together, we have brought together a network of uh, 18 major national organizations that are going to share information and collaborate with regard to how to respond to the government's proposals so that we can find a way of dealing with this issue that uh, certainly is more positive and more likely to be productive and result in fewer, broader harms than what the government initially proposed. And we'll be sharing more of that information on our website and with the public uh, in the near future. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, we'll look forward to as many of you as possible joining us next week on the 18th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you. Good night. Great. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Great. <laughs>